Hello, everyone, and welcome to another fun food. Let's try that again, shall we? It's not, it's not, it's, a, <laughs> that's not the whiskey, I promise you. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another fun filled episode of From Startup to Wunderland with Nicholas Kuna. Today, I'm very excited to have uh, Stephen Fry with us. And Stephen Fry is going to help us demystify brand science, which is his proprietary process. So, Stephen, great to have you on board. Nicholas, thank you for having me. And thanks, listeners, for, for joining us today. Excited to see where we're going to go and how we can uh, uncover and demystify marketing for you and give you some really good nugget. So excited to see where we go. So other than nuggets, I'd like to talk about, I'd like to talk about, I mean, people can't see it on, uh, on screen now, but I think something that your particular listeners are used to or viewers are used to is what's in your cup. So you're going to have to show <laughs> us, show us your funky cup. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So there's always a joke of what's in the cup. Cause you know, when you go on an, on like, an, like the Tonight Show or a late night show, they always have people drinking out of mugs with the brand mark on it. So I'm always drinking out of my Fox cup. And today we have Coke Zero in there. The joke was at the last podcast I was on that it was whiskey. And so the running joke is whether or not we're drinking whiskey. I do believe that whiskey does increase the excitement and fun for the person on the podcast. I don't always know that it translates to the listeners. So we're, we're backing off today and we're just sticking with some good old Phenylalanine, you know, phenylalanonics, the 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 fake poison sugar, Coke Zero, Coke for men. That's what we're drinking today. I like it. Well, I mean, I think drinking while you're doing a podcast is very bad form. So, so we want to ask what's in my what's in my glass. So, um, Stephen, brand science. Yeah. Can you maybe? Talk to me a little bit about who you are, uh, a bit of your background, and where did this concept of brand science come in? Because I think brand science now, it used to be seen as more of an art, but you're turning it into a science. And I'd love to hear a bit of the, the background. Yeah, absolutely. The so I was, so I was, I don't want to say I was a special kid, but I mean, growing up in a small agrarian town. There's some kids that, you know, they go in their trajectory of sports. And, and I went in the art and music. I, I played tennis. So that just kind of gives you the, you know, the vibe. Like, I'm just, it wasn't your stereonormative kind of, you know, farm town kid. I was always in musicals. I was always in the art room. And, and so, lo and behold, of course, what did I get into? I wanted to move to Nashville to write music and took a job in an ad agency. So I did, again, the art and music -y thing. And through just a variety of experiences learned, I really loved kind of that intersection of commercial art and how are we marketing and how are we sharing brands. And so ultimately brand creation was really like, ooh, like, like I could like, like just geek out on this all day. And in fact, I don't know if anybody else had things that they did that were really unique, like to them, like doesn't everybody memorize a book? called you and your aquarium and memorize all the the freshwater and saltwater fish doesn't everybody do that and so so i didn't realize that i was on the autism spectrum and so that kind of catapulted me and i put those those pieces together later but that was one of the main reasons why i love exploring and i have such curiosity and wonder about the world around me with objects and information and see them in a different light and so ultimately the way i'm wired helped me just kind of find the path that I was meant to be on. And so discovered branding. There's a great book called Designing Brand Identity by Alina Wheeler. She just recently passed. She was an informal mentor of mine. And, and there's six editions of the book, six ones coming out. And I found this book and it, it was like, ooh, I could do this all day. So instead of memorizing fish, I was memorizing, you know, the process, the branding process. But it led me to this assertion of like, wait a second, what's, why, why does it work that way? And that really propelled me into kind of exploring, you know, cognitive, you know, psychology and sequence of cognition and, and how we experience the world around us and system one, system two thinking and all these kind of different phenomenology and even just things like the U.S. researching the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Like, let's go do that. Like, see, oh, did mustachioed logos have decreased 39 percent since 1902 and then spiked up like finding out all these things you know 
if you're familiar with Yogi Bear, he's smarter than the average bear. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, ooh, is Steven was just not your typical brand designer. He's smarter than the average brand designer, maybe. Just was peak by these things. And it catapulted me into exploring and discovering the world of, that I now call brand science. Uh, but it's just a small little corner, little geeky corner of marketing science. And I simply say marketing is any activity that says, hey, do business with me. And then we say branding itself are the mnemonic devices that help us remember that brand. And I like to sit and geek out and explore about the science of how do we make those memories more effective so your brand can grow. And you can share uh, what you do, who you are and why it matters with the people that matter most to the world. So that's wonderful. So when we... when we look at brands in our current in our current context, so we've got AI, we've got what I call sort of the brand royalty, like your Coca Colas, your Fords, your your large organizations, where the brand, you know, the brand value is measured on a daily basis or on an hourly basis and impacts on the bottom line of the business. How important is a brand actually for a regular business? Don't they just need a logo to slap onto onto their product and and do some social media ads with a promo? So what's really interesting is when we're looking at those examples, I call them blue trips. I like how you call them royalty. It's interesting when you look at the age and stage of a business. Businesses in this sense, not trying to get political, just if we could use metaphors to describe it, sometimes it's a nascent or an incubated. Sometimes it's a baby. Sometimes it's an infant. Sometimes it's pubescent. So you kind of have this like, you know, infancy, toddler, just think of that as a metaphor. And then when you get to like those blue chips, those are kind of legacy brands. They're in their prime. It, it would maybe be like uh, the crone or or the king or the queen. Those would be, you know, they've gone through kind of that arc and now they're at the top of their, their category. And when we look at those examples, those are typically examples that are on a high, massive scale. And we'd like to say, oh, we can't invest in our brand at that level. So then we, we're satisfied with activities that are smaller and we think that doesn't make sense because we're not at that level. We don't need to do that or shouldn't do it. But here's an interesting thing. Believe it or not, Coca-Cola, who has a variety of assets that are specific to them, call those distinctive brand assets. You know, always Coca-Cola, you know, in the polar bears and Santa Claus and What's interesting, when we step back and we look at them, we can organize those into what I call a distinctive brand asset palette, like almost like Bob Ross has his little paint. Oh, here's some words we can use. Shape. Oh, color. Oh, color combination. Oh, photography. Sound, music, character, celebrity, spokes, spokesperson. You know, there's all these different sensory objects that they're using to create memories. Here's the interesting thing. The more memories you create, the more people will think of you and grow. If we use this cognitive fallacy of like, they're too big, we don't need to do what they do. And then we say, oh, I'm just content. I have just my brand mark and maybe a color and a tagline. That's three. To actually make a difference and create memories and people to think of you first, you need at least 15 to 20 distinctive brand assets. So it doesn't matter how big you are, the science of how people's brains work. If I had, you know, you know, Nicholas's cupcake company and you're down the street and all you had was a generic shape of a cupcake, it didn't have your name, it didn't have a typeface, it didn't have a color, I would, it's not memorable. So then here's the other thing. Well, there's, well, there's Steven's cupcakes. Steven's cupcakes is orange and it has a cat on it and what, whatever. It's like, vibrant I, I remember oh yeah the one with the cat and the cat's like licking the little frosting <laughs> you know like and there's all these like sensory experiences i walk in and they have orange penny tile and there's like fun upbeat music but it's not too in your face all those sensory experiences create memories so that when i'm going throughout my day and i'm like oh man i can really use a sweet treat where do i The brand that has the more memories is the one you're going to think through first because our brains love to conserve energy. Our brains are lazy. Like, I want to say this in the most loving way. Your brain is lazy. My brain is lazy. It doesn't want to have to do more work. So it's like, hey, can we consolidate these memories into like a a two-lane highway instead of a four-lane highway? And they do. So then they're like, okay, cluster of memories. 
orange, cupcake, cat, sensory, object. And because those memories, those nodes are bigger, we think of that brand first. So your question was, do we need to be doing what they need to be doing? Absolutely. We don't want to mistake the fact that our business may not be on a mass market scale, but the activity of how people make memories and how people remember us, that's the number one way to grow your business is based on having distinctive brand assets. And the more that you have that are unique and famous to your brand, the more people will remember you regardless of the size of your business. So you, you brought out quite a, a few amazing points there and I, and, and all of them, obviously I will put a little, a little, a little tick on, but one thing that folks seem to forget is that, and, and you, you mentioned this sort of subtly in there is that this takes time. Brands are built mm -hmm. over a, over a period of time. You talk about Coca-Cola, you talk about those, those brands. The way that you generate memories is by being consistent and creating, you know, bringing that orange cat, the tiles, et cetera, that sound, the, the specific flavor profile over a period of time. So brand building, I, I always say a brand is a living asset. So it's something that you've got to feed, you've got to keep adding sure. to it, you've got to manage, manage it over, over time for it to be, mm -hmm. to be powerful and strong. And you, you talk about those phases from a toddler to a teenager to an adult. And those, when I do sort of consulting to brands as well, it's talking, which stage are you in? Exactly those, those kind of stages. Are you in the toddler stage? These are the steps that you need to follow. Sure. Teenager a stage, you don't know what's going on. Things are a little bit all over the place. You've got pimples, et cetera, et cetera. And when you're an adult, okay, then you are the, philanthrop the philanthropist father. You are the the caregiver, you are the, you've got a variety of different roles as your brand progresses. So if we look at Coca-Cola, they're now in the grandfather or the, the, the late stage in brand. So a lot of, there are different expectations from them in terms of, you know, making sure water is used properly, all the impact they're having on the environment, sure. et cetera, versus a startup brand. And I guess those are the kind of discussions you, you would have with your, with the folks that you speak to. On that point, you do a lot of workshops and you do a lot of talking to brands. What kind of businesses come and talk to you, Stephen? Yeah, that's a great question. So what's interesting is brand science isn't category dependent. You know, I may use examples about retail or examples. If you've heard me on other podcasts, uh, I talk about cookies and I say about Oreo and then there's the economy, you know, package right next to it that's also blue and it's a near knockoff or even toilet paper. And I use examples that are kind of common every day because we, we shop, we all experience these things. But here's the interesting thing. Brand science and branding isn't specific to just retail or consumer packaged goods or fast consumer goods. It's, it's, it's prevalent in every category because why? People are in every category. With any business that serves people, and so, so I've, I've worked over in, in 65 different categories and I kind of just stopped counting. I just say 65 plus, like, <laughs> like just going to stop. I don't know how many more industries are there. I mean, maybe if you look on Yelp or, or, or like whoever has like the master list these days of categories, you know, automotive and banking and you know, whatever, yeah, you know, it works in every category. And because people are in every category and at the end of the day, you're talking with people and you're saying, hey, do business with me. And these modalities change. And if you're not familiar with that term modality, it just means the, the, the delivery method. So if you look at, you know, advertising, how it started, you know, from like long form print, then to the advent of radio and then print and then radio and TV and then print radio, TV and cable. And, and, and all these delivery methods are going to keep changing. And as a result, we're going to have different types of marketers pop up. There may be like, VR headset marketers soon. I don't know, like, you know, magic eye implant marketing. I don't know. These <laughs> modalities may change over time, but the principle is people are everywhere. And so brand science works for every category, works for every brand. And like you said, whether it's in, inception, infancy, growth, matrimony, maybe they get married, you know, they merge, midlife, prime, legacy, or even decline. We forget that decline and, and sunsetting is actually a thing. Sometimes people, a merger and acquisition work to sell out and consolidate. So the life path of the business, the age and stage of the business and the category isn't, depend, uh, isn't dependent on brand science to be effective. 
because we find that people are in every category and people make memories in every category. And I like to kind of tie this whole idea together to say, I believe that people are the most important thing. People are the most important people. Ideas are the most powerful and brands connect those two. And we've all, we've all like, you know, there may be brands out there that's like, you know, economy tissues and there's no compelling story behind that. That's fine. There's room for them. It's very utilitarian. Everybody has boogers, whatever. We have needs that we need tissues for. And then there's other brands that conceptually are important to people. Whether you like, if you like motorcycles and you're really into like, ooh, performance, we look back and we step back, ooh, Honda. Honda has an archetype that's based on performance and being a global leader. But if you're looking for freedom of expression and individuality and the open road and maybe a little twinge of just like that wild rebel, maybe Harley Davidson is for you. And so we find that the brands that are conceptually tied to these archetypes or motivators or motivational lenses, these interpretive lenses, have a stronger rooting in, in their propensity to succeed. So brand science can work for your brand, but if you actually really are rooted in your idea, it doesn't have to be bigger than anybody else's. It doesn't have to be the biggest one out there. You know, if you look at, you know, examples of like the dollar menu near with McDonald's, and then there was another brand, Hardee's. And they, they figured out that men kind of 35 to 55 are hungry and they want a big juicy burger. They don't mind paying seven bucks and then became the advent of the commercial where it went mm. and the, like the, the burger hit the, the, the white isolated background. And then there's like, the so they didn't have to win when it came to price. They had to win when it came to taste. So your big idea does not need to be the biggest idea in your category. It just has to be a little bit bigger or distincter than someone else's for them to remember. And what's cool is that brand science works for every category, every business, every agent stage. We're going to go a little bit more in terms of what the brand science process is, but I want, you've sure. mentioned, we've mentioned a couple of cool brands like Coca-Cola and Harley Davidson. Those are cool brands and you can, to generate ideas for that, there's a cornucopia or plethora of, you know, nice opportunities to, to create brand stories. What about B2B. Does brand science work for B2B? Absolutely. You know, typically when you look at a B2B category, there's some principles that actually shine a little bit more in the brand science process. But, but if I can just g go back a little bit, why is it important for B2B companies to have a brand? Because one of the challenges is they say, well, I don't need to have a brand. I'm not Coca-Cola. I'm not, you know, I'm selling HVACs. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So that, that so, is a bit of context. Yeah. So if you're selling HVACs, here's the thing. There may be some very functional features. There may be some functional features. My dad is a well driller. So I know that when he's talking to Foremost, which is a uh, well drilling rig company, and he's talking to them about the new model he wants them to create or work with them, there's obviously a different conversation than then he's farther along in the customer experience when he's in that consultative phase. We need to not mistake and think that B2B doesn't need a brand and B2B doesn't stand for everything because we don't have that same customer experience. What's interesting is, is they still get customers the same way. They're trying to get emotionally distracted viewers in their everyday life to notice them and then enter into a conversation. The conversation just may be different. And so at the end of the day, yeah, I do need to know some of the basics. Oh, it's a dual rotary rig. And they, they, you know, and that's kind of into the product. And, and so, but it's B2B. And so, yeah, I may be a lot about the facts, but at the end of the day, things like warranty, things like craftsmanship, things like, you know, is this, is this zinc or is this aluminum? Those have real life applications and translations that mean durability, dependability, or speed, or there's a direct effect on the quality of the job, which has an emotional result. So you, you spoke about a couple of points there that I, that I, that I think are keen, uh, that are key. You spoke about dependability, that they're warranties. These aren't things that people, when they think about brand, think about, Right. Well, it depends on the category because here's what's really interesting is if you and I were going to play in Fenway or we we're going to play in Wrigley Field 
or if we're going to play the Super Bowl or pick a sports, every arena or golf course is different. And the same as every category. And there's a thing called category norms or design congruency that exists. So every category kind of has its own first base that we need to make sure that we get to that's unique to them. And then they also have what the industry does. And so you have to be within those boundaries. So if having a warranty is expected of your brand, that's just kind of a, a customer's first base. Like that's like, duh, that's expected. So sometimes the ingredients in the cookies, if we're using cookies as a metaphor here, I kind of expect the majority of cookies to be made out of flour. I'm not going to the metaphorical cookie aisle to look for stuff that's made out of flour. It's expected. I'm expecting to find chocolate chip cookies. I'm expecting to find some that are chewy. I'm expecting to find some that are crispy. That's not the wild factor card. So if the, if the features and the benefits that you're trying to, to, you know, point out to your customer are common everyday components, then that's not really distinct. So the distinctiveness comes down to is what are some distinctive points of where we can hit the ball in this ball diamond? Do we want to just bunt it and be just like the blue knockoff version of Oreos? Or do we want to have our own unique cookie that's white chocolate macadamia nut with toffee sprinkles in a parchment cup? Everything from the delivery and the experience is in a different container. And that metaphor of container is a really good describer of the customer experience and how you deliver your experience for B2B and B2C services. It's the same thing. I saw a billboard the other day and it has no one we're going to be on time. And it had a picture of a little app and a smiley face and the truck. And why? Because that's notorious. If, if you have a, hire a plumber, you never know when they're going to come and you want to track where the guy is and when he's going to be there. So they were sharing a dis- distinctive point that said, hey, we've got an app and you can showcase us. In five years, maybe everyone will use that app or that third-party service and it'll be, but as of right now, that is distinct to them. So at the end of the day, the container of your delivery of your experience in bringing people into the conversation is the experience and that is the brand and it's the whole sum of the experiences. Those experiences just happen to be a little bit different walking up to the moment they notice you you're, they're attracted to you and then they decide to get you. And then you move into a different phase, which is the delivery and the experience. So brand science, the heavy lifting is right here before we enter. The heaviest lifting that brand science does is it's right here before we enter the customer experience. And then it's reinforced all the time. And then, like you said, it's, it's the Coca-Cola assets. And then, you know, next quarter, there's footballs on them or there's music notes on them and they refresh the assets to keep them fresh. Like someone comes in your house every two weeks and just tidies things up and you could just tell they're fresh. They're not stale and dusty. And that's the same thing with our memories. That's the same thing with what brand assets are. Brand assets are a way to keep things alive and moving and living in the expression because if we don't stimulate those memories and keep them fresh in the memory cluster that's on the top of their mind, in the forefront, if we don't keep that alive and fresh, it's not going to stay top of mind. So regardless of the industry, especially B2B, we want that person to call us whenever they need a new pump. They need to call us whenever they need their HVAC service. They, we want the, them to think of us first. And so there's all the experiences before they become our customer and then during our customer and then how we nurture them and keep them in the loop. So we're going to go through a couple of points. One, luckily, I've just done a, I did some training on the weekend to be a little league coach. So at least I know what the diamond is and those little things. So, so that, that's good. That's cool. good. So, so, so glad I, know I could reinforce metaphors. that for you. <laughs> Please tell me if I'm missing, uh, messing it up. I don't know. Yeah, no, you, I think, I mean, you only, we just, we've just got to first base. So, I mean, let, okay, so okay. let's just, but the, the second thing is I want to talk about how brands are differentiated per markets. You spoke about Coca-Cola's assets being the Father Christmas and the polar bear. Now in South Africa, we have no, our Christmases are boiling hot and we have no polar bears. So there's no snow or anything like that. So those assets do not exist in South Africa. All of those adverts about the train and the trucks going through the snow, we don't have that. We have no polar bears drinking that. We have completely different branded assets 
focus Absolutely. on our market, which is a, a which is a hot um, hot environment. Absolutely. I, let's do a quick case study. I'm I've got a cookie brand which is undifferentiated, but I've got a special ingredient that just turns people on, gets them excited about this. It's it's biodegradable packaging. We are completely environmentally friendly, but nobody knows about us. I come to you and say, look, I've got this great product. We're getting sales, but we're not expanding. We're not. We've got very bad uh, repeat customers because people just go for somebody else the whole time because our name isn't out there. How are sure. you going to, how can I work with you to solve this problem and create a brand? Because we are a small little company and now we are ready for the big leagues. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. And that's actually the type of problem that I solve every day. A uh, great example, I had a client come to me with that exact same scenario, different category, but same scenario. So the, the, the process is the same, but here's the first thing we do. First thing we would count, we really need to count and we're going to put some link in the show notes. It's bit.ly, if you're familiar with the bit.ly link, it's very easy. It's bit.ly, but bit.ly forge slash brand science checklist. The first stop on the brand science method train is we need to count how many distinctive brand assets you have. The average business typically only has three to five. So you may have your name. You may have, you know, the actual word itself. Then the stylized brand mark. That's another word. You may have a color maybe a tagline and maybe a proprietary photo of your cookie on the package. So maybe three to five. Here's the interesting thing. You know, you mentioned about a uh, geocultural contextualization about how in America we have, you know, Santa Claus. And so that's, that's, that's cultural contextualization. So that's also another category that if, or, or a, a form of evaluation that we have to look like, okay, are we saying the right things? Like Chevy Nova means no go in Spanish. That's one of my favorite examples. We won't say anything Shout about the, the Pinto. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. So, yeah. so the bean, the bean <laughs> car, whatever. So the, we want to look at how many assets you have. That's the first stop for any brand, regardless. We don't want to jump to making assertions. We don't want to jump to making assertions about your category size. I want to stay in cookies, but maybe there's a reason you're like, you're like, we need to like, what are we going to do? We're going to create a loyalty program and we're going to try to target loyal switchers. And we make all these assertions that may not actually be true. Chips Ahoy just has a large market share. They may have 70% of the market and they're just that big. You're probably not going to make that much of a dent of getting that market share from them. But you can look at, okay, what is our mental availability? What is our assets? That's the first step. So we count the assets using the brand science checklist. And it's just an easy checklist. We would go through and say, how many word, shape, color, sound, music, character, you know, in those categories break down into, you know, color, color palette, you know, story breaks down into archetype, content strategy. That there's you know, illustrations, photography, and we break this out. We're going to count those. Our goal is we want to have at least 15 to 20 to start. If you're a new brand, you need at least 15 to 20 to start. 15 to 20 is about the magic number. It's almost like people will remember you at a party. If you go to the party, what do you need to do? You need to introduce yourself. You need to make a genuine connection with someone. Maybe you need to wear something memorable. Maybe they need to have chemistry with you. There's a couple kinds of experiences that you need to have when you're in a party networking. And this is the same thing. You need to have a couple sensory experiences with a brand for them, for your customers to even notice you. And then you need repeated delivery. So unseen is unsold. So we're going to go look at what, what initially are your exposure or your brand um, uh, channel entry points. And we're not going to get to your website. We're not going to get to ads just yet, but we need to start make sure you have traction on this bottom phase. And the goal is we want to count these things. And then we can go and we can start to evaluate the other things. Before we get into distribution, before we do SKU optimization, before we do how many products you have, we have to look at mental availability, physical availability, and scale. Those are the three flywheel metrics of any successful brand. That's what Mars Pet Care uses. That's what Target, Market, Michaels, Walmart, any of the big brands they use. They may have their own version of this, but this is mental availability, physical availability, and scale. And we have to look at the distinctive, you know, the pace and pop. What does your merchandise displays look like? Do you have a highly distinctive, you know, is everybody in, in, in 
the cookie aisle one color, are you distinctively different? Where is that placed? Are they four packages wide and five up? You know, what is your shelf space? So there's different considerations based on your different industry. But with that example, how you are presenting and people experiencing you, you have, they have to notice you. And that's actually a great acronym for any brand, regardless of any category. Notice, attract, get. You have to nag your customers because unseen is unsold. You want to make a big splash at a convention with your new HVAC company or service or, you know, Okay, are you actually reaching out to all the people that you know are going to be there? Are you also driving traffic and telling them about a cool giveaway at your booth? Are you giving them swag? Have you trained your sales personnel? Are they going to follow up? At the end of the day, nobody wants your business card. You need email. So do you have an email list? And all of a sudden we, we get, you know, partnerships and product placement and all these other things, you know, maybe, maybe uh, podcasting or writing blogs, all these different marketing modalities, they have to be the right fit for you to get in front of people. And they're different based on each industry. So we can't use a one size fits everybody approach. Um, and honestly, would you drive a car if it had five engines and five gas tanks? I wouldn't. That's really redundant. The same thing with your marketing. You, you, you kind of like, and there's an example someone used recently that it's like a plane and there's two engines. We want, you know, like we can actually like one of these like plane engines can go down and the other one will keep us going. That's how your marketing should be. Like we really want two marketing channels. For me, I know podcasts and partnerships are my best ones because if I'm sharing resources with other people who are like-minded and their communities, you know, benefit each other or just hearing me speak, hearing me talk. So then I don't focus on all these other ones. So what, what this does is we're pulling back to our, our example is our cookies. How do we know our cookies can be successful? Yeah, we're going to look at our channel entry points and all the activities we're doing, but it's going to start with, okay, are we distinct? Can people just tell that we're, you know, we're unique and we're different? Is there a little orange cat on it? Like, or is that appropriate? You know, I think of Annie's as a great brand. Annie's Organic here in the States. There's a little, a little bunny. And the color palette is fun and it's bright. And it's all about organic and, but it's organic and it's approachable. So it's not overly designed. It doesn't feel too bougie. 99 cents for a box of white Vermont cheddar mac and cheese. And I can eat the whole thing. So that all gets rooted in like, what is the story you're trying to say? So archetype. And, and at the end of the day, people are emotionally distracted viewers going about their daily lives. We want to make it simple. We want to make it simple. We don't want to overcomplicate it with, with convoluted ideas that our customer avatar is a girl named, you know, Megan, who's from Chicago, who's 32, who loves French bulldogs and the color teal, and she shops at Whole Foods. At the end of the day, the majority of the demographics are, are, are really redundant. Are they people who want to go from one state to another state of mind or being? Not everything is a problem. Sometimes people want to be happier. Sometimes people just want to eat a cookie. Like there's like, what's this I, hun hunger? Like, no, not every cookie has to be about the story of hunger. So maybe it's a story of an indulgence. But when we root our brands in distinctive brand assets that share those motivations that are distinct, they're connected to very true archetypes. They communicate the idea. For us as marketers, we can talk about this all day long. But when somebody looks at it, well, Underwater basket weaving for otters. Oh, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Oh, orange cupcake cookie, orange cupcake place. Oh, Froyo place for tweens, you know, or, oh, HVAC services for, for industrial companies. Like the concept just needs to be so easy. We just get it. We notice it. Oh, I get it. Oh, water with minerals. Cool. So the, the idea is, is we want to make it simple. We want to make it so simple. The work we do to make it so simple seems and feels complicated. And that's where the science can help us because at the end of the day, we want to make it easy for people to experience us and have that authenticity that we are who we say we are and, and we do what we say we do. Um, so we want to cut through the fluff in a very, very noisy world uh, to people who are distracted and they're going about their daily lives on autopilot and by them recording those memories, making those memories, uh, that's how they're going to remember us into that next phase. So for the cookie company, 
cookie company. We're going to look at your, your distinctive assets. We're going to count them. We're going to test them and see, are they really distinct? Or are you doing too many things that triggers and looks like your competitors? And what is the language that you need and use? And is it the right language that customers are looking for? Because at the end of the day, you know, a really eco-friendly, I don't buy, co- I don't buy cookies because I want to save the environment. I think that's, that's just a double, that's like the triple bottom line, like the customer company environment. Like that's just a, like it's expected now. Kind of like Tom's shoes. Like it was a great idea, but it wasn't sustainable. People don't buy stuff because it's not like you want to buy a great pair of shoes. And if you've ever worn Tom's, you know what I'm talking about. Like I've never bought one, but I tried one on they horrible. But like <laughs> we don't buy stuff to feel good unless like it's like different kind of category of stuff. You know what I'm saying? So about the the emotional impact of our product. Like that that needs to be tucked in in part of the story. So so the cookie, the cookie language would need to be rooted in the right foundation, visually and verbally. So that's really where it all starts. I, I like when you, I, I like talking strategies. So when you start talking about that as this new co- cookie company, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to beat um, Chips Ahoy with 70% of the market. Uh, part of the journey with working with brands is to explain to them what part do you play in this whole basket of, you know, of, of cookies. And maybe after 10, 20 years or however amount of time you can, you can start eating away at that market share, but you're not going to beat Procter & Gamble or Unilever or, whoever, or Kraft, whoever owns Chips Ahoy because of their distribution system, because of their pricing points. I mean, so, you'll never make money if you try and go after that, that particular market. And I suppose you have that discussion. It's very important to have yes. that discussion with the client as well. Say, so, okay, let's set expectations. Where do you want to be? We can get you there. So we can absolutely get you to 70%. Absolutely. But do you have $10 billion? Right, right. And what's interesting is we, we have an idea of success that I think is very clouded. Um, some people create, most people create companies because they're a senior level technician. I, I start a cookie company because my grandmother was a baker and she taught me her recipe and I love cookies and now I'm starting it. And then, but I didn't get into payroll. I didn't get into it because I want to do payroll and taxes and all these other things, distribution and manufacture. I don't, so there's this, this idea that the different life cycle and stages of our business and our brand that how do we know what to do next? And the thing that I love about brand science is based on the agent stage of your business, there's a very distinctive focus of your, your marketing that when you're in the traction phase, we need to get like market penetration and we need to get introduction and validation. We need to get into our first few company, you know, customers, and maybe that's subscriptions or whatever your model is of X amount and that's mental and physical distribution. Like, so you have whatever that's visits to your web page, purchases of, you know, subscriptions on Substack, whatever your widget is, there is a marketing activity that you need to make sure that you're doing for you to get traction. And that's like all your brand assets. That's your brand strategy. That's working through your, your content strategy and making sure that you're telling a story and you're building a solid brand platform. Cause here's the thing, pyramid success. You think success is at the top? of this pyramid and you're trying to build your operations, you're trying to scale, you try, you may have something in your business that's really great. Maybe your product sales are up, but without a, a good solid foundation, uh, it's all pyramids, believe it or not, are four-sided. Most people forget this. We look at charts and we think of them. No, like there's, there's, and, and all of you are listening, including Nicholas, are like, wait, is there, wait there is that really it's have so the pyramid I'm using as four sides. So there's a base, but then there's a side to each thing for each level. So there's brand, there's operations, there's experience, and there's admin. Basically, for the sake of today's metaphor, there's four different sides of your business and big boxes that are basically brand, operations, delivery, and experience, and admin, you know, legal, support, all that stuff. And if you want to grow your pyramid, each one of those levels has to go to the next phase. Because you build a pyramid from the bottom up, unless you watch the History Channel and you think aliens did them, I did them. As humans, we need to build them one side at a time, one level at a time. So the goal is we want to build that level one part at a time. And so brand science takes out the guesswork. So the first thing is you got to work on your brand platform. Even if you're, you know, you think you're like in the prime of your business and you have a great, 
we're still going to go through just like, oh, kick the tires off. How's the platform? Oh, it's good. Oh, we need some foundational work. Oh, we need to, you know, fix the mortar, whatever. So that you go through and you double check so that you can go to the next phase. Once you get your product and market validation with your cookies. And then, then your next phase, your 90 day sprint. And this is what strategy planning is. I'm going to blow your mind if you've never heard this. Brand strategy literally is your business goals plus your brand identity. What? <laughs> like, like people are like, ooh, you need a brand strategy. Okay, you can hire me, but I'm just going to make it simple for you. Like, literally, you have a business goal. Oh, where do you want to get in the next 90 days? Awesome. How are you going to use your visual brand assets to communicate those things? Oh, you want to be the number one purveyor of widgets? Oh, and you identified you want to go to this conference? Okay. That's our brand strategy. We're going to go to this conference and okay, now we're going to create, you know, keychains, promo pieces, tents and all that. Brand strategy literally is just taking your brand, telling the story through activities that drive the business results that you want. So if you're doing that, do you want to have a $10 million exit? You know, I look at so many of these products that are bought by bigger portfolio companies. It makes sense. Do it. We can sell the cookie company if we want. If we want to exit, if we want higher distribution and we want to get out of the business and we want to do, you can do that. You need to know what is the end goal. Like you just want to grow it as big as you want to grow it. Okay, then do that. Or do you want to grow it as big as like money can grow it and then you get investors and then you sell it. Oh, you can do that too. But here's the thing. You can have those five years goals, those 10 year goals. But it starts with 90-day sprints, and it starts with 90-day brand strategy to get you to that next business phase. And it starts with you looking at the agent phase you are and looking at the brand science activities for your brand to take you to the next level. So your brand channel, you know, your brand platform, then you look at your website and your channels. And it basically is a glorified version of test, optimize, scale. Like, here's our idea. Let's perfect it. Let's test it. Oh, once we've tested it and perfected it. Oh, now we can go out and run campaigns on a mass scale and become that conceptual brand authority. We're the only, you know, you know, cookie company made out of tapioca and rice flour that's not gritty, that tastes sugary and sweet and with biodegradable mushroom packaging for kids who love cute characters i don't know whatever keep your brain going, keep going keep, keep digging going. keep digging. the hole is getting bigger and bigger yeah, yeah. Uh, but whatever your concept is your concept is your your north star this is your north star it's not to be the number one in your category it's to be for me it's to be the number one adorable brand science guy next door that loves cats and drinks out of cute cups and likes to tell all his friends about brand science and he does that through going on podcasts and publishing a partnership. That's it. And I am my own comparison to where I'm going next, not my competition. And and it's like it's like doing CrossFit. I don't know if anybody listens here. I'm sorry if you do CrossFit. I hope you love it if you do. Uh, but I know that when you do CrossFit or working out, you're not competing against other people. You're competing against yourself. Same thing. Cross country competing against yourself, getting your best time. That's the same thing with your brand. You're competing against yourself to say, how do I move forward? It's not upward, it's forward. Everyone is moving forward. And sometimes brands are alongside you or they're farther ahead of you. And that's more cohesive to an understanding of business and branding together than looking at it as hierarchy. Because that's not actually the reality of the lives we live. So I feel like I'm in I'm in church because I feel like saying amen and you and you're telling and you're telling the truth and you're telling the truth right now. <laughs> so and and I and I totally ascribe to those points. So Stephen, we could keep honestly we could keep jabbering on, but this is not Joe Rogan's four hour long uh, program. I think people will start passing out. Where can I get folks to contact you if they want to know a little bit more about brand science and how they can build yeah, their brands. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to give you some link in the show notes. And one, the easy one is, you know, Linktree. If you're familiar with Linktree, it's like link.ee. <laughs> Just like bit.ly is like bit.ly. But I've got a link, Linktree link and you can click on there and you can see how your brand is doing with the brand science checklist. 
You can watch my award-winning talk. That's about 10 minutes. You can gain confidence and build a brand plan for your future. We've got a program, got a program called Brandpreneur, and that is a revolutionary, you know, 10 week program for purpose driven brand leaders. And the whole goal of that is to help you create an actionable plan based on where your brand is at and move forward and be move forward towards you becoming that industry authority that you are, you know, created and made to be. So again, like I said, people are the most important ideas are the most powerful brands connect the two. That's the goal there. So you can check out the link tree. You can check out the brand science checklist. You can watch my talk. You can check out Brandpreneur or you can book me to speak or teach a workshop. Add me on LinkedIn or you can just go to my website, see what I do, read the blog, read about how I think there's no such thing as a customer avatar. And then you're going to get mad at me after. Yeah, you're going to have people getting people are going to people, gonna be like, yeah. you are wrong. And you can find out what Brand Science says about that. You can find all those things on the link tree that we're going to put in the show notes for you. And you can also send me an email. Be like, hey, Steven, I heard you on this podcast. I loved what you had to say. I hated what you had to say. And I'll be like, hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more. Awesome. Well, Stephen, it's been a treat having you on, on the show. And uh, yeah. Oh, it's been a, a treat. We're going to we're gonna have to talk about uh, some case studies, I think, on our next chat. Absolutely. And uh, listeners, thanks for joining us today. It's been, been great being with you. And I hope you got some actual nuggets of brand science that you can take away in your world. And maybe some whiskey in your cup or whatever you prefer to drink. Yeah, I think we'll end it there. <laughs> mm, come chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth.